Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When we look at the Word of God, one of the ways that we can describe Scripture is truth. Truth that leads us to God. And when one comes in contact with the living God, what is this one going to do? Worship. That is to say this, there is a connection, biblically speaking, between the concept of truth and worship. And if you're not worshiping God truthfully, that is, in line with the Word of God, well, you're worshiping what you do not know. You're worshiping in a way that does not reflect the characteristics of biblical worship. And let me suggest to you today that the vast majority of people who have the best intentions are not truly experiencing God in their worship. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of John in chapter 4. The book of John in chapter 4. Now, for the last uh, several verses, we see that Yeshua is in a conversation with, of all people, a woman and a Samaritan woman all the more. Why is that so important? Because, as we've talked about, Samaritans and Judeans didn't have any relationship between them. And what I want you to see is that this uh, anti-Semitic quality that the Samaritans had, now they were descendants of Jacob, but they did not like that term, the Jews. And they had animosity, and it was all stemming from one thing. They didn't like the Jewish people because they said, we're going to worship where we want to worship, and we're going to do it how we want to worship. And if it was good enough for our forefathers, it's good enough for us. So they cut off all ties, and they saw no spiritual significance for Jerusalem in the future. There's many people today that believe that there's no spiritual significance from a future standpoint for Jerusalem that they don't think that Israel, the land of Israel, or the people of Israel, the Jewish people, that there's any more important role for them. That that covenantal relationship, them being the chosen people, all of that has been done away with when the new covenant was established. Well, let me tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. Well, look with me, as I said, to the Gospel of John and John chapter 4. The last thing that we saw is that Yeshua said to this Samaritan woman who, based upon her own religious upbringing, she was missing out on what Yeshua was saying. She kept turning back to the physical and missing out on the spiritual. She kept looking for the here and now rather than understanding the future reality of the kingdom. And my fear is this, that many people, many of which who named that name Jesus or Yeshua, many of those same people are missing out on the power and the transformation that the kingdom wants to make in your life and my life. So the last thing that he says to her is that salvation is of the Jews. Look on to verse 23. Now here he says, but the hour is coming, and now is when true worshipers. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that how you would like to be thought of? Are you someone who is truly worshiping God as God wants to be worshipped? What I want you to see here is that the people of Samaria, they were not. Not one of them was doing it the right way. And the last time we looked to the Judeans, those around Jerusalem and in that holy city, likewise. They were being led by two groups of people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees, they didn't have any expectation of a, a kingdom coming. 
They didn't even think God was, was involved anymore in the affairs of man. That he simply created everything and backed away. So the Sadducees who controlled the Sanhedrin during this t time period were far removed from prophetic truth. That's one of the reasons is that they didn't believe in the prophets. Likewise, the, the Pharisees, the other leading party who Yeshua related to, they had embraced a, a non-Torah religion. That is one that was rooted in, very similar to the Samaritans, but a different expression, the tradition of the elders. And both groups, although one had Jerusalem as a capital, both groups were far removed. And that's exactly what Yeshua was saying in this passage. Why? Well, look again to verse 23. He says, For the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and what? Truth. And don't miss this. There is a connection in this passage, and really throughout Scripture, between the Spirit and truth. Why is that? It is only when you are in base embracing prophetic truth that you're going to find redemption. You're going to be able to understand the means of redemption. And as we see, for example, in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 20 and 21 and 22, we find that one of the outcomes of having a redemptive relationship with God by means of Messiah is that you become a recipient of the Holy Spirit. And it's only when we are walking, anointed by the Spirit, living and expressing truth, then and only then are we worshiping God. And what we see back then is this, no one was following truth. No one was sensitive that the Spirit of God was not uh, anointing them, not moving in them. They weren't experiencing His leadership and they were fine with it. She was fine and the Judeans were fine with it. But those who were at all interested in prophetic truth, they were the ones that we're moving towards the message of Yeshua. So look again, he says here, for the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For also the Father is seeking such to worship Him. So he's seeking, and what that means is this. It means that God is at work. When it says he's seeking, he's at work calling what? Calling people to himself. For those who are burdened and want to experience God, God is going to move. He's at work to give them the reality. So he's seeking such to worship him. For God is spirit. Now what it says is this, the God is spirit. And what that means is, unless there's a spiritual dimension about us, that is to say this, unless we are recipients of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to be able to worship God. We can acknowledge God. We can do various things that show that we believe in God. But just believing in God is not experiencing God. And that's the change. God is saying here, now the time is at hand where you can begin to experience me in worship. So God is spirit and those who worship him in spirit and in truth, it is, there's that word again, that word day. In, in Greek, meaning what? I hope you know it by now, which is absolutely necessary. So let's look at that scripture again. It says, God is spirit and those who are worshiping him, if they really are, they're going to be doing so in spirit and truth. That is, it's not, oh, I just led by the spirit and therefore I want to do this and I do. That's not being led by the spirit. Being led by the spirit is when you are following truth. Why? It is truth, obedience to the truth, that, that releases the Spirit, that anointing. Now, the moment you become a believer, you are sealed with the Spirit. But, but you can grieve the Spirit. You can hinder the Spirit. You can rebel against the Spirit. But it's only when you are walking in truth, basing your life on scriptural passages, all of God's Word, then and only then will the Spirit of God be leading you and you are going to worship, and that word worship is related to service, you are going to be serving God in a way that's pleasing to Him. So he says here, 
For in spirit and truth it is necessary, it's absolutely necessary to worship. The woman says, now he's speaking, and she's growing in her understanding. Why? Because in this next verse, when the woman begins to speak, she names Messiah. She believes that there is a Messiah. And she also knows when Messiah comes, everything's going to change. But here's the reality. Messiah's inner presence. That's what he's going to reveal. Look at it. We see here, the woman answers him and says, I know that Messiah is coming, the one called the Christ. And whenever that one comes, he will what? He is going to proclaim to us all things. So she is saying, you know what? Up until that time, we are just, you know, going to be going about our business. We're waiting for Messiah, and He's going to teach us all things, meaning all things related to the kingdom. But right now, all of that is what? In the future. The problem is this. Messiah is there. The problem for us is that Messiah has already came. And if we're not worshiping in spirit and truth, if we're not kingdom-minded, the problem is this, that we are rebelling against the purposes and the plans and the movement of God in our age. So she says to him, I, I know that there's a Messiah coming, this one who is called the Christ. And whenever he comes, and it uses a term in the subjunctive like, like we don't know when, there's no evidence, but there is evidence in the scripture when Messiah will come, that is when he came the first time and when he's going to return. It says, and that one will teach us all things. And Yeshua says to her, I don't like this because in one sense you can say I am he or I who is speaking to you am him I am the Messiah but the way it says here it says ego a me what is that literally I am who is speaking to you now that is more powerful perhaps he is saying I am him that is Messiah who is speaking to you but he does it in a way saying I am which is a powerful term relating to God. Meaning simply, God is in this conversation. God is moving. And obviously, He's acknowledging that He is the Messiah. And that's why it's so odd that people will say, and I hear this all the time, those of the rabbis, they'll say, you know, Yeshua never said that He was Messiah. Oh, He might be a prophet. He, 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 he was a teacher, perhaps. But, but never does He say that He was Messiah. Oh, really? Right here. He says, I am him who's speaking to you. And look at verse 7. And at this time, right then, who came? Verse 27. At this time, his disciples came and they marveled that with a woman, he was speaking. Here again, not just a Samaritan woman, but a woman in general. It's out of the ordinary. But this is important. Why? Why, as we talked about. Every time a woman is emphasized in the passage that she takes the for foremost place, what happens to the context? One of redemption. That's the new context. So Messiah is speaking about words of redemption, that He's the Messiah, that He's the Redeemer. So look again, verse 27. At this time, at this statement, Messiah is saying, I'm He, I'm the Messiah. His disciples, they came and they marveled that with a woman he speaks. But at no time did any of them say uh, uh, to them, what, what are you seeking? Or why are you speaking to this woman? Meaning they didn't say, why, why are you talking to her? What, what do you seek from her? Never did they bring it up. Therefore, we find here that, that she left her well, the woman, and she went into the city and uh, she says to the men, come and see the man who has said to me all things that I have done until right now. This one is the Christ. Now, it says here, puts it in the question, but that question mark is not in the original language. So, so I don't believe that she's a doubt, doubting person. She's saying she's doing exactly what, what we should be doing. She has come to believe based upon what? She says, this one, and we're just getting part of the conversation. Messiah has made it very clear to her that he what? That he knows her. And you know what? We should be under the truth that God knows everything about us. And this woman knew what? 
that, that she had failed so miserably that she went from one marriage to another and now she's living in an adulterous relationship. I mean, she probably would have thought, what a failure when it talks about holiness and purity, when it talks about a covenantal marriage reflecting the love of God and His characteristics. And, and here I am, having failed miserably and now committing adultery. But nevertheless, God, remember what He says, I am, am the one speaking to you. God, because Messiah is God. See, this Bible makes it very clear that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It affirms the concept, even though the term Trinity never appears in the Bible, the Bible affirms that concept of, of three persons, one God. We don't worship three gods, one God in, in Messiah Yeshua, in the Holy Spirit, and in God the Father. So I don't believe there's any question in her mind. She goes and says, I've met the one. He's told me, he's convicted me about everything that I have done in my life. And come and see because this one is the Messiah. Well, move on. Notice what happens. It says here in verse, verse 30, Therefore they went out of the city and they came to him. And notice what it was saying further on. We find here in a very, very unique way that they were, were asking him, that his disciples were speaking to him, Rabbi, what? Eat. Now, what is this a, a reference to? Well, we're getting to a climax in the spiritual conversation here. This woman has been convicted of herself and the fact that uh, she needs change. And she is gone and she just doesn't keep it to herself. She goes and tells all the men, here again, men and women didn't have much interaction. And here she is going, this adulterous woman. And she's bringing people to who? The Messiah. And what I like is the disciples come at this high climax of this, this meeting. And what are they thinking about? <laughs> They're thinking about food. Now, here's the problem. The disciples, one of their shortcomings is that they're always into the natural affairs. They're not what? They're not kingdom minded either. So look at this passage very carefully. It says, in the meantime, the disciples, they asked him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat, which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, you know, uh, uh, who was it? I mean, we haven't brought to him something to eat. And Yeshua says to them, my food, and here's the key, my food is that I should do the will of the one who sent me and complete this, for this is his food. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that when we submit to God's will, when we are engaging in the things of spiritual truth, when we're serving God, God is going to provide supernaturally for us. Here's the, the truth. Yeshua had traveled a great distance. It was in the hot heat of day. He was at this well. He wanted something. He didn't drink, nor did he eat. He wasn't hungry. Why? Because when you're Focusing in on the work of God, there is a energizing. There is a power that comes to you. That's what he's trying to say. He doesn't need the physical to serve God. That's not what he's depended upon. So this is what he's trying to tell the disciples. He says, look again, verse 34. My food is that I should do the will of the one who sent me. Why is that important? That term sent having to do with what? submissiveness, having to do with always denying oneself for the purposes of God. He says, my food is that I should do the will of the one who sent me and completed, for this is his work. Verse 35, for, for do not say, do you not say that it's the fourth month is coming and therefore the harvest is coming. Behold, I say to you, Okay, and he speaks about how lift up your eyes and look at what the fields, because they are white for the harvest already. What he's saying is this, when you are focusing on the physical, you're going to miss out on the spiritual harvest that you can receive. 
Look again at this passage. He says the fields are white. That means the time is at hand to take. You know, there's a scripture. It's from the book of Proverbs, and it says, He who is wise wins souls. But you know what? If you check out that scripture, it doesn't say that. It literally says, He who is wise takes souls. But you have to be spiritually perceptive. You have to know what soul is ready for the taking. Just like you look at a plant and you discern whether it's ready to be harvested or not. There's signs, there's evidence of that. So he's saying, guys, speaking to his disciples, you know, you're focusing on the food. You're focusing on why I would be speaking to a Samaritan woman. You understand all the things of the world, cultural sensitivity, cultural norms. There's this problem between societies and peoples. You understand food and hunger and what to buy and all of this. But what you are missing out is on the spiritual indicators of your life. Now, go back to that verse, middle of verse 35, he says, uh, it's four months, and you say the harvest is coming. Why four? Four, biblically speaking, is a number that's related to the world. What he's saying is this, you understand the worldly harvest, but you don't understand the spiritual harvest. You don't understand that, that God has sowed, he has led others, his prophets, his other servants to work, and there's a harvest to be taken. And if we're not spiritually sensitive to those things, we're going to miss out on great, on great potential, on a great harvest. So he says, look at the end of verse 35, he says, And the fields, they are white for harvest already. And the one who what? The one who harvests receives a reward. Now what's that? That's motivation. We should be people who understand that when we participate in the harvest of the kingdom, bringing people out of this world and into the kingdom, that there's a great reward for that. So he says, and the reaper receives a reward. And what else? He says, and they gather their fruit into eternal life. That's the reward. That we're going to have fruit for what? The kingdom. That's what he's saying here. So here's what we have to ask ourselves. Are we people that are interested in the kingdom of God? And whether we are or not is not going to be really answered by whether we say, yes, I am or no, I'm not. I mean, most people, you ask them, you know, if, if there's a kingdom, would you be interested in that? They'll say, yes. You want to be there? Absolutely. But the indication of whether those are true statements is this. See, Messiah has testified there is a kingdom. Do we believe him? And the rewards for the kingdom, do we want those rewards? If we do, we're going to be about the kingdom business. We're going to be harvesting souls for that kingdom. So he says here, and, and the one who gathers up this fruit does so for uh, eternal life in order that the one who sows together with what? With the one who reaps, they rejoice together. For in this, the word of God is true. See, one sows and one harvests. And he says, but I have sent you to harvest. Now, I believe that is a true statement today. Yes, there's the, the aspect of sowing. But I believe from a spiritual standpoint, what God is saying is that He has done a great job of sowing. There are people that we simply need to do exactly what Yeshua did in this passage. Don't miss out on the context. He simply speaks to a woman and He speaks to her based upon the, the situation that presented it to Him. They're at the well, she's coming to draw water, and he turns that conversation into one of speaking about the kingdom. Let me ask you, can you do that? All you have to do is be willing to do that. Why? Because God will supply to you the words. He will give you, if you say, I want to share the words of the kingdom, I want to be someone who harvests souls for the kingdom of God, God is going to bring you to white fields. He is going to put you into context or into contact with people who has been sowed, who has been watered, and now ready 
to be harvested for the kingdom. That's what he's saying. And that's where the greatest reward is. So he talks about this and what else does he say? He speaks about a joy that comes from that. So once again, look at the scripture. He says, I am sending you to be reapers. Okay. He says this, and that you do not grow tired, but others will grow tired. But you, he says, you're not going to. Why? He says, because of what he's going to bring about in your life. He's talking about that he's going to cause you to endure and labor because, well, here's what it is. When you are interested in something, when you are passionate, when you are committed to something, you, you don't get tired of doing those things. The hours just go by. And furthermore, notice the context. He doesn't have to worry about being what? Well, there's few laborers that are willing to go out. There's laborers doing other things that wear out, but, but not us. Why? What does he say here? Well, if you go back to the context, he's speaking about the will of the Father is to do what? To do his labor. And what is that? What does he call that? He calls that food, meaning this. When you are about God's business, when you are doing the things that he calls you to do, he will supply. He will nourish you supernaturally so that you will be equipped. And you're not going to be people like we see at the end of, of that section that, that wear out, that, that, that just can't labor any longer. No. We're going to be people. We're going to be people that persevere that have endurance, that are able to do the outcome that God has called us to do. See, when we're walking with Him, what do we find? Well, let me give you a biblical example of this and we'll close. Remember Elijah the prophet? See, he went, the scripture says that he was feeling dejected, he was fearful, and what did God do? God touched him, that's all. God touched him and He gave him one meal. And with that one meal, what happens? He goes running for 40 days. Now that's supernatural. So let me just tell you, if God is able to give you the strength that you might run and run and run without growing weary, don't you think that He can give you the strength so that you can be a person that harvests souls that, that are about the kingdom business. See, we don't need to worry about fatigue. What do we need to be concerned with? We need to be concerned with being faithful people for the kingdom of God, being passionate, and God will supply, as the scripture promises, He will supply our every need. Well, once again, I'm out of time until we continue on next week in chapter 4. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.